Welcome back to the channel. I'm glad you're here, because today, we're diving into one of the biggest engineering battles happening right under America's nose. California is known for sunshine, surf culture, and tech startups that promise to revolutionize your toaster. But behind the glamour, the state is wrestling with a crisis that affects every single person living there. And frankly, everyone who eats food grown in the US. So grab a seat, because the story of how California is fighting to stay alive isn't just important. It's eye-opening, it's massive, and it might be the blueprint for the future of drought-stricken regions around the world. The Water Crisis California has always marketed itself as the land of abundance. The beaches, the oranges, the tech giants who promised to reinvent your entire life through apps you didn't ask for. But behind that postcard image, the state is quietly fighting one of the most relentless battles in American history. Running out of water. Not just, your lawn looks a little sad dry, but rivers turning to dust dry. Reservoirs pulling away from their shorelines like they've given up, and farmland cracking into patterns that look like someone tried to bake the entire Central Valley in a giant oven. But here's the strange part. California sits right next to the biggest body of water on Earth. You can stand on the beach, stare at billions of cubic kilometers of ocean, and still get a letter telling you to shorten your showers. If that doesn't feel like a cosmic joke, I don't know what does. This crisis matters for more than the 40 million people who live there. If California were its own country, its economy, worth over $3.5 trillion, would be the fifth largest in the world. More importantly, its agricultural sector feeds America. One third of the country's vegetables, two thirds of its fruits and nuts. Without California, your grocery store suddenly looks like the shelves forgot to load. Yet the state that feeds the nation can barely feed itself water. And the reasons, surprisingly, aren't new. California sits between the cold Pacific Ocean and the towering Sierra Nevada mountains, a combination that works like a giant atmospheric shield. Moisture gets blocked. Rainfalls land mostly in the north. Meanwhile, the south drifts towards semi-desert. For decades, that imbalance didn't matter because nature had a trick, snowpack. Every winter, snow piled up in the Sierra Nevada like a giant frozen savings account, then melted through spring and summer, keeping rivers and reservoirs healthy. But that system is failing. In some drought years, snowfall has dropped by 20 to 60 percent and melts weeks earlier. California is now in what many scientists call its worst drought in 1,200 years. Major reservoirs like Shasta and Oroville have fallen to around 40% of capacity during the hardest years. And that's where the story shifts from nature to engineering. Before we go deeper, hit like and subscribe so you don't miss more stories about the hidden technology behind everyday life. California realized it could no longer sit around waiting for mountain snow to behave. So it turned to something bigger, bolder, and much more stubborn, the Pacific Ocean. Desalination. Imagine someone tells you, great news, we found an unlimited supply of water. Then they pause and add, but it tastes like salt, ruins pipes, and will dehydrate you faster than running a marathon in August. That's seawater. It's everywhere. 
It's practically infinite. And for most of human history, it's been useless to drink. Then came desalination. Along California's coast, giant desalination plants are designed to drag seawater into the mainland, scrub it clean of salt, and turn it into something you could pour into a glass. These plants are engineering on the scale of small cities. The process starts far from the shiny machinery. Underwater, engineers install huge intake pipelines made from carbon steel or HDPE, often two to three meters across. Think of pipes so big, you could drive a small car through them. Each section is lowered by cranes connected with high-pressure gaskets, then anchored to the seabed so waves and currents don't turn them into gigantic underwater noodles. Those pipelines pull in millions of liters of seawater every day. A 63-centimeter pipe alone can drag in 15 million liters in a single day. which is more than 10,000 liters every minute, enough to fill a backyard swimming pool before your coffee finishes brewing. But here's the twist. Seawater doesn't come alone. It brings friends, jellyfish, crabs, stray seaweed, the occasional confused fish. So the first line of defense is giant intake screens that block anything larger than about four and a half millimeters. If it has legs, tentacles, or an attitude, it's not getting in. Then the water flows into massive sand filtration tanks. Picture water trickling down through layers of sand while dirt particles cling to the grains. The sand moves slowly downward, almost like an escalator in reverse carrying trapped particles away. After this stage, the water looks cleaner, but it's still nowhere near drinkable. It still contains microscopic particles, tiny enough to annoy engineers, but too small to see. Enter chemistry. Sodium hypochlorite disinfects. Ferric chloride clumps tiny particles together so they sink out. It's like adding a little organizing manager into the water. All right, everyone, form groups and get out. Then comes cartridge filtration, fiber cartridges with micron level pores. When a cartridge gets clogged, it's swapped out like a printer toner cartridge, except it weighs more and causes far fewer office arguments. Only after all this does the water meet the real star of the story. reverse osmosis. This is the heroic, high-pressure process that separates salt molecules from water molecules. Salt ions cling to water like your phone clings to battery right when you need it the most. To break them apart, desalination plants use pressure around 60 bar. That's 60 times atmospheric pressure. Essentially, the plant forces water to move through an ultra-fine membrane, but salt gets left behind, confused and rejected, like it failed a nightclub dress code. After the first RO stage, the water is mostly clean, but not clean enough. A second RO stage polishes it further, stripping out remaining ions and lowering electrical conductivity to near-perfect purity. But ultra-pure water has a problem. It tastes like nothing. Humans aren't meant to drink water stripped of all minerals. So desalination plants add back controlled amounts of calcium and magnesium, adjust pH, and restore the kind of natural mineral profile you expect from drinking water. Now the water can move through high-pressure pipelines into massive storage tanks, and eventually into municipal systems or farms. 
But here's the catch. Desalination works incredibly well, but it's expensive. Two to four times more expensive than traditional water sources. So California needed another piece of the puzzle, one that had actually existed for decades. The aqueduct system. Long before anyone built reverse osmosis membranes, California engineers took on an even bigger challenge, moving water across a state bigger than Italy. Because remember, most of California's water falls in the north, but most people live in the south. So the state built one of the largest water redistribution systems in human history, a web of dams, reservoirs, pumping stations, and aqueducts stretching hundreds of kilometers. Some engineers call it the water highway. Others call it organized insanity. It starts in the Sierra Nevada. Winter snow piles up meters deep, then melts into rivers. But instead of letting that water flow straight to the ocean, engineers built colossal dams, Shasta, Oroville, Folsom, creating reservoirs that hold tens of billions of cubic meters of fresh water. These are literal water banks, saving excess for the dry months. From there, water enters two giant systems, the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project. Their backbone is the California Aqueduct, a nearly 700-kilometer artificial river built by human hands. It cuts through valleys, crosses deserts, and even climbs mountains. In places where the aqueduct encounters steep terrain, gigantic pumping stations lift water more than 600 meters upward. Imagine pumping water vertically higher than two Eiffel Towers stacked on top of each other. That water is then distributed through concrete canals and branching pipelines to farms, cities, and industrial hubs. The cost? Tens of billions of dollars to build. Billions more in annual maintenance and electricity. Some regions have had to raise prices simply to keep the system alive. But here's the twist. The aqueduct system wasn't just built for the past. It's becoming the backbone of California's future. Today, it can seamlessly connect mountain snowmelt, aqueduct flows, and desalinated seawater. A multi-source integrated water grid. Would you trust water that traveled 700 kilometers across deserts, mountains, and cities before reaching your tap? Tell me what you think. This blending of sources is what keeps California's agricultural empire alive. Millions of hectares of farmland in the Central Valley depend on this year-round supply. Without the aqueduct, many of those crops simply wouldn't exist. But there's one more source California has embraced, one that makes some people uncomfortable, even though it's scientifically impressive. Wastewater recycling. Here's the funny thing about water. It never disappears. It just gets dirty, travels underground, evaporates, rains again, and repeats the world's least glamorous recycling program. California decided to speed that up. Wastewater recycling takes the water that leaves homes, factories, and farms, cleans it, and turns it into something so pure it can outperform natural sources. The journey begins underground. A huge sewer network collects everything. Toilet flushes, shower water, sink waste, industrial discharge. What arrives at the treatment plant is unpredictable. Plastic bags, sand, bits of wood, grease. Things that make engineers question their life choices. The first guardians are bar screens. stainless steel grids that remove large debris, 
Then grit chambers, remove sand and small stones. Next comes primary treatment. The wastewater flows into huge settling tanks where heavy solids sink into a layer called primary sludge. Mechanical skimmers collect grease from the surface. The water becomes noticeably clearer, but the real magic happens in biological treatment. Aeration tanks. These massive basins bubble with oxygen, waking up billions of microorganisms. These microscopic workers devour organic waste. They group into clusters called flocks that eventually settle out. After secondary treatment, the water is clearer still, sometimes clearer than river water. But it still contains microscopic contaminants, so it enters microfiltration. Stacks of membranes arranged like a fortress, blocking bacteria and small particles. Finally, the water passes through reverse osmosis, the same membrane technology used in desalination. High pressure forces pure water through membranes, leaving behind dissolved contaminants. What comes out the other end can be astonishing. Water so clean, it almost feels futuristic. And yes, some of that water goes back into aquifers or reservoirs and eventually becomes drinking water. It's a closed loop that ensures not a single drop is wasted. Economics and future California's water system is big, big enough to reshape landscapes, move rivers, and keep millions of people alive in a place nature never designed for that scale of human life. But all that engineering comes with a cost. Desalinated water is expensive, two to four times the price of traditional sources. Aqueduct maintenance is costly. Pumping water over mountains eats electricity like a hungry teenager discovering a refrigerator. Yet the alternative is far more expensive. Losing America's food supply, shutting down cities and watching communities collapse. So the question becomes, how do you balance cost, sustainability and reliability? The future will likely be hybrid. More efficient desalination using renewable energy. Upgraded reservoirs built to withstand shifting climate patterns. Smarter water management, sensors and predictive tools. Expanded recycling facilities. And perhaps most important, a cultural shift in how people view water, not as an infinite backdrop of life, but as a precious resource worth protecting. California isn't perfect. It struggles, it innovates, it argues with itself, but it also does something extraordinary. It refuses to give up. In the face of droughts that break historical records, California engineers build systems that bend the environment to keep 40 million lives moving. It's a reminder that water scarcity isn't just a California story, it's a global preview. And if California succeeds, it won't just save itself, it will teach the world how to survive a century that's getting hotter, drier, and more unpredictable. Thank you for watching. And if you learned something new today, tap that like button. Subscribe for more deep dives into the technology shaping our world. Keep your curiosity switched on before it evaporates.